When I'm on a world tour, I take a, a travel case with me, like behind this painting here. You see the, the box down there, pastels and brushes and pencils and crayons. A lot uh, of the time that I spend on tour is interacting with people in my room. So I say, stay like that. And that's why I end up doing a lot of portraits. You know, and when no one's there, I look out the window and I do a view of Chicago or a view of Boston. Wherever you may go, it's just nice, the, the, the change in scenery. But, you know, more often than not, I'm, I've got so many commitments musically and sound checks and uh, interviews and things like that that it's very hard to find any time. The thing that I can't get out of my mind about Ronnie Wood when I first think about him is that uh, he said, I'm the first member of my family to be born on dry land. <laughs> he was a water gypsy, very pleased about that. His family went up and down the canals in this country, and I think it was his grandfather had a, a wife in at least two ports, perhaps more. Uh, and he was born on dry land, and his feet are half in the water and half in the land. He's such a good-natured man. He's terrific company. When he comes to the South Bank Show Awards, which he and Tracy Emmons seem to come to every time, he has a great time and everybody around him has a great time. He's an enjoyer and an appreciator. And he's a real rocker. You see him in group after group, at the moment with the Rolling Stones, but he's also got his own group and is up there playing and he's in the middle of the music. And people know that and they respond to it. And that's why he's so popular. He's popular because he's good and he's good, I think partly because he... Did you learn by listening to your heroes and trying to do what yeah. they did? Yeah. yeah. And who are, you, who are you listening to, who are you trying to teach yourself from? Well, I was listening to Smokestack Lightning and things like that from Howlin' Wolf and uh, Muddy Waters, you know, um, Uchi Coochie Man. And, but in those days, it was very difficult to get anything uh, bluesy going because <laughs> the shadows were ruling everything. Every band that was uh, going up did the sidesteps with <laughs> the movements with their... <laughs> me all these fabulous uh, Hank Marvin riffs, you know, they were very clever, but at the time they seemed to me like, that's not the way to go, you know, horrible. So I just wondered why these guys were fidgeting around, you know, and why didn't they just get down to the meat? Ronnie Wood's career really took off when he teamed up with Rod Stewart in The Faces. Met in a pub called The Intrepid Fox in uh, Ward Wall Street. Street. <laughs> Yeah, he came up to me and said, hello, face. <laughs> we didn't know we were going to be in the faces together. But he just had a, a record called Good Morning Little Schoolgirl. And he had a black eye and the, the bouffant, the, the, the check the jacket, you know, the proper Rod the Mod, yeah, <laughs> fabulous. Uh, but we got on really well ever since, and he's, he's changed very little. I have to tell him he's a great bass player, yeah. a good mate, and his guitar playing is superb. And now he's cleaned up his act, he's playing even better. And when was the last time you played together? Oh. Just after the war, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Crimea War. After five years with Rod Stewart and The Faces, Ronnie Wood left to join the Rolling Stones in 1975. Oh. Were you a bit overawed when you joined the Stones? Well, there's no reason you should be overawed. Was it difficult to join? Yeah, I was overawed or... because I always wanted to be in that band from college, and I said, well, I'm going to be in that band. Really? Yeah. And I just happened to make myself in the right place at the right time. Is the experience of a big band like the Stones, is that very different from, say, the Faces, or was it just a, a, another, dig, another shift of gear up? Well, the, the Stones are very much more well-organized uh, working unit you know it's a fantastically well-organized unit whereas the faces was um, a very um, odd bins sponsored uh, you know very <laughs> um, party very party yeah do you feel pressures from being in that band 
as yourself as a musician or as part of the band itself? Not pressures so much as limitations. I think that's why Mick Taylor and Bill Wyman couldn't stand it for longer than they did. Bill hung in there a long time. But there's uh, lots of limitations in, uh, it's very hard to get a song across uh, past the Jagger Wretched um, you know, closed shot. But then again, they've, you know, I didn't write Satisfaction and they have that kind of ammunition where they've had proven magnificent hits and a back catalogue of hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of songs, which are fabulous songs. But, you know, I, um, I've always realised that I'm that much younger than them. My time would come. I've, I've been like this ever since I've worked with, you know, Rod Stewart was always older than me, you know, Jeff Beck, you know, all the front men, you know, Jagger Rich is that much older than me. And um, so I thought, well, I don't mind taking a back seat here. I'll get a song across. And I have done over the years. I've got at least 12 or 15 songs into the Stones catalog. <laughs> much more than a survivor you know he um, he's sort of it's almost like he's just reached his prime it's almost like he's had an epiphany you know he, um, he he's reached a point in his life where it's possible that he's he's sort of he's worked it all out you know he knows you know he knows what he's doing now he knows where he's going and, and you know there seems to be very little chaos in his life and it seems you know he, he looks great he seems happy you know. this picture was my favorite from the shoot and it was actually Ronnie's as well the irony of this portrait is you can't, you can't see Ronnie's face, which in terms of portrait photography would technically be described as a disaster. It's unmistakably Ronnie because he's stick thin um, and he's got really cool hair. <laughs> the bit I like about that is that it's a portrait of someone's hands. It's actually the hands, it's Ronnie's hands that do all the work. It's the hands that play lead guitar in the Rolling Stones. It's the hands that do, you know, create the paintings. He's producing new work, he's producing brilliant work. The band are touring. His painting's prolific. He's doing his own music projects. It uh, it seems it doesn't seem like the end of anything. It seems like the beginning of lots of other things. <laughs> It's stored here in New York, so uh, I've got plenty of guitars in London and Ireland, but uh, these are my stage ones that, um, that are always with me when I go on tour. I haven't played guitar since the tour, hardly. I've just done a couple of gigs. I did one with uh, Shell Crow and one with the Stereophonics, but um, apart from that, I haven't hardly picked up a guitar. I've been writing a few songs, mainly on the piano. This is a fretless uh, instrument here. There's just something earthy about it, and... Uh, it's, it's an extension of your own body, and it's shaped like a woman. <laughs> so. Nineteen fifty-five um, Fender Stratocaster. <laughs> flow but normally when we're going to do a tour we um, rehearse for at least a month and get um, well oil you know oil the machinery again to get back into um, tour mode and the same when we're in the studio we just play and play and then gradually mold the songs finished um, 
October this time, so I still find it hard every night at nine o'clock. <laughs> Where's the gig? <laughs> You know. What's it like being up there with the sounds, doing that, facing those people who just want to hear more and more music and you want to play more and more music? There's such an adrenaline that comes from playing live to people. Uh, and when you get the feedback, it's hard to, uh, to drop it. Time leaves you, uh, you know, you're in a, in a space um, which is very wonderful and you don't really want it to end. And it won't end as long as you're on stage. I mean, until you, you drop with exhaustion, I think uh, the body takes on a different gear. There's another side of him, which is Ronnie Wood, the painter, which he takes rightly, very seriously. He has a serious knack of getting a likeness, which isn't easy. He takes his paints and his canvases and his drawing paper with him wherever he goes on tour. And that aspect of his life is something he likes to talk about. Uh, he has exhibitions in New York and in London. I think he slightly worries that it's way down below his reputation as a musician. But he's not going to stop doing it. He's going to stick with that just as he's stuck with his music, just as he's <laughs> stuck on dry land. You painted a lot of the stars, a lot of pop stars, and that's. Yeah, that was my way that. in yeah. as a portrait yeah. artist. I yeah. thought, well, if I can get my foot in the door... Yeah. Although so I that was a calculation on your part? Yeah. And it paid off, obviously. Yeah, it did. I mean, since then, and people are still finding out that I can draw horses or landscapes and buildings or whatever. I'm trying to aim towards um, what I want to do rather than commission... I, I enjoy the commissions, but it would be lovely to find out what I really want to do, and it's something I don't really know yet. That's all right, you can catch me adjusting. Um... There was a boy a very strange enchanted boy They say he wandered very far, very far Over land and sea A little shy yeah, I want to make sure we get the other big ones up. Yeah, do you want to tell me a little bit about this one? Um, it's well, a... this is a tribute to William Orpen, because I'm the biggest collector of Orpen ah. um, originals. I've got all of his drawings and letters, and about, I don't know, 12 or more of his original oils. That's his first uh, oil painting, which I own. It's called The Boy Under the Apple Tree, so I just thought I'd do a tribute to it. And I collect drawings from Picasso, and I thought I'd do a tribute to uh, Picasso. We're, we're actually going to do adjustments in, in the morning. The, this whole front part of the gallery is going to be Ronnie's as well. And we're going to try and select. The front is always important, of course. It's like the first thing that people see when they walk in the yeah, gallery. It's important. Actually, in this gallery, they see the front, and then they see that back wall. So yeah, they're really That's very important. I'm glad you got them up there. Yeah. But after Ronnie leaves, the gallery owner decides to put the more saleable pop paintings in pride of place.
One of the things that came out of these bans uh, was the, the involvement with drugs and drink and so on. You are widely reported to be in, in your time, not now, as being heavily involved. How did, did, was, was that, did that seem at the time to be inevitable that you were going to get involved in this? Was just everybody doing as it were? When Keith and I first met, and he was like, terribly under his cloud, uh, Mick was pretty far out as well. Um, but it was, um, if you can't beat them, join them, or just join them, really, at the time. Uh, but the great thing is that uh, I never used to like the needle. I think um, if I'd have been a needle person, I probably wouldn't be around to tell the story today uh, of the amount of people that we just saw drop in like flies. It was very hard, really, to um, survive that uh, time. I mean, I enjoyed myself. I always knew my limits, I think. A lot of artists, I mean, De Quince is the most famous example in English literature, but all over the place thought, took drugs because they thought it enhanced, made them better at what they were doing. I mean, did you feel that at any stage, that it was making you better? When you were younger, you thought, yes, I'm better because I'm doing this. It certainly did in the construction stage, like writing songs. Yeah. Uh, it certainly helped. And exploring them and taking them through their paces, the, the drugs and the, the alcohol and, the, you know, or whatever kind of dope it was, was, in a way, uh, whether uh, uh, we were younger then, and I, I think the illusion was uh, easier passed over, you know, like, okay, we got stoned last night, we're, you know, back together, and what we did was not that bad at all. But nowadays, it, I'm sure if I tried it now, it would be, oh, my God, you know, uh, what a woolly sort of thing I laid down. If I had done it now, uh, I could, would have seen it much clearer. Do you, did you think at the time that it helped your performance, that this somehow made you more intense, gave you, you were closer to the, uh, the soul of things, that this was helping you? I, I took the good things out of the acid experience, for instance. And, and I think I did the same with the, the cocaine, even though it took much longer to give up. Uh, you know, the heroin was, um, I just used to smoke it in cigarettes and like, pff, unbelievable uh, windows that that opened. And, and I always thought, no, if I'm um, in my late 70s, Keith and I said, we're, we're in our late 70s and in pain, we'll take that up again. <laughs> it's the, the best painkiller there is. But um, it, it's all uh, an illusion, really. But, you know, proof of the pudding was in my last Stones tour. You know, I did it straight. And um, I've never seen anything so uh, clear in my life and, and felt so good and confident about what I was playing. But, you know, it's not to say it's not bloody hard to do. Mm. Mm. But you knew, you knew when it got too bad to continue with, when it got too bad, when it was obviously not helping, when it was uh, damaging you. Yeah, well, I think um, it's always damaging you. Like um, cigarettes, they're the worst ones, and that's what I'm fighting with at the moment. <laughs> really hard to give them up yeah if you're a smoking type person like i am yeah you always want one it's awful isn't it yeah but yeah you know, i can just uh, get rid of that monster again you know but it's it's hard <sighs> but uh i think i'm making good progress i mean i haven't had a fact this is the first interview i've done for you know ever without a cigarette and a drink you know so things have got to be improving well, I'm glad I was here to see it, right? <laughs> <laughs> I'm honoured that I did it in front of you. <laughs>